We are here with Dr. Hemel Gada, Medical Director of Structural Heart and Interventional Cardiologist here at UPMC Pinnacle to talk about aortic stenosis. Dr. Gada, what is aortic stenosis? Aortic stenosis is a very prominent, prevalent uh, condition that affects people's quality of life and uh, their length of life as well. Uh, it involves the aortic valve, which is one of the four valves in the heart. It's the gatekeeper valve. It's between the bottom left chamber, the left ventricle, and the aorta, which is the main highway to all of your organs as far as blood is concerned. And the problem with the aortic valve that would arise with aortic stenosis is narrowing of the aortic valve, and it's typically seen in elderly people. Who is at risk for it? Yeah, so people usually over the age of 80, about 10% of the population develops significant aortic stenosis when they're over that age. And that just basically has to do with uh, calcification of the aortic valve, which typically looks like a Mercedes-Benz sign. It has three leaflets and uh, they calcify pretty uniformly. However, there are some conditions like having a congenital bicuspid aortic valve or being born with two leaflets that can lead to very aggressive calcification of the aortic valve early in life. And that could cause aortic stenosis at, um, at a very early age. How many people have aortic stenosis? Uh, millions. Uh, it's a very uh, prevalent condition and it's something that uh, definitely rears its ugly head uh, no matter where you are in the country um, to a very large extent. Is aortic stenosis hereditary? Most forms of aortic stenosis are not deemed hereditary um, and that's just because people when they get health conditions late in life there are a lot of confounding factors that can lead to development of those medical conditions. So. While some of it may be hereditarily linked to like the predisposition to developing calcium on certain tissues or certain blood vessels, um, aortic stenosis itself in most forms is not considered hereditary. What are the symptoms of the disease? So there are three cardinal symptoms related to aortic stenosis. One would be chest pain or the feeling of angina. So a lot of that has to do with uh, the blood not receiving enough oxygen via the uh, arteries supplying it because aortic stenosis restricts flow to those arteries. And also the valve puts a lot of pressure on the main pumping chamber of heart, left ventricle. And so there's this oxygen supply demand mismatch which can occur that can cause some significant chest pain. Shortness of breath uh, from back pressure related to the aortic stenosis and fluid building up on the lungs. And then finally, uh, being lightheaded or passing out because of lack of blood flow to the brain. Those would be the three cardinal symptoms, but it could be as vague as just having progressive fatigue and feeling downtrodden and thinking that it's related to old age when it's not really that. What are the treatments for the disease? So most people will get surveilled until they hit um, a certain level of severity. And uh, that level of severity is usually defined on an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound image of the valve that takes pressure measurements and calculates the actual area within the valve and um, that can determine whether or not um, someone is in need of treatment. Uh, the aortic valve itself uh, is very commonly studied on these types of uh, ultrasound images. The treatments uh, usually are surgical in nature. Uh, we'll look at a very comprehensive picture of the heart and see if there are any other problems that need to be rectified in the operating room at the time that someone received an aortic valve replacement. But a very new and exciting phenomenon that's really occurred in the world the last 16 years and in this country the last 11 has been transcatheter aortic valve replacement. And that's something that I personally do many of. What is transcatheter aortic valve replacement? So transcatheter aortic valve replacement is a way of replacing someone's valve without needing to do any kind of chest incision or excising the valve or putting someone on heart lung bypass or stopping their heart from beating. It's typically a metallic or a metal alloy stent platform that has um, pericardial tissue, the outside of an animal's heart, that's fashioned into leaflets, sutured in on the inside. That's then crimped into a small plastic tube called a catheter. And then that valve is deployed in a variety of different mechanisms, but basically takes the place of the old valve by knocking it to the side. And people always ask me what keeps the new valve in place. And it's funny because that calcium is both a burden and a blessing. The burden is that you've developed this severe aortic stenosis, but the blessing is that the actual valve that now sits within the aortic valve is, um, is binded by the calcium. 
who is a candidate for this procedure? And another name is it is TAVR? Yes, so transcatheter aortic valve replacement, or TAVR, um, has been uh, really uh, growing as far as the, uh, the treatment offering is concerned. It now embraces about 65 to 70% of eligible candidates for an aortic valve replacement. And now with lower risk surgical populations being studied in clinical trials, more and more people are deemed to be candidates for potential transcatheter aortic valve replacement. So this is becoming a go-to for people who have isolated aortic stenosis as a really tried and true therapy. What is your experience with the TAVR procedure? My experience with the TAVR procedure has become better and better over time, and largely because of the technologies that are employed in that procedure. So we're able to do these procedures with very low risk to the patient, and we're able to get them out of the hospital quite quickly. Uh, so after the workup is done, which usually involves the standard preoperative test that we would do prior to an open heart surgery, after those tests are done, we're able to do the procedure, get it done within an hour or two, and have the patient out of the hospital usually by the next day. And uh, that's something that we've uh, come to tell our patients, and uh, they rely on us uh, being able to do that routinely. What are the risks with TAVR? One of the major risks with TAVR is the risk of stroke, and that would probably be the worst risk. A lot of patients tell me, and to be you know, quite blatant, a lot of patients tell me that they would rather die than have a stroke, and that is a very powerful message. Um, the reason why is because we're doing the TAVR procedure to really restore quality of life in an expedient fashion, in a rapid fashion. And uh, when you um, have a stroke, the, uh, the main detriment to you is your quality of life, the things that you were able to do and the things that you were able to enjoy in life and that being stripped away in a very inhumane fashion. So strokes are really the main complication that we try to avoid. Obviously mortality is another one, trying to make sure the patient survives the procedure. And then other things like the need for a permanent pacemaker and vascular complications related to um, blood vessel tears and that causing bleeding, those would be the major complications related to a TAPR. How could stroke occur during TAPR? So stroke can occur in many ways. Uh, most of TAPRs are performed with a small needle puncture in the groin uh, in a place called the femoral artery. And when we manipulate our catheters up the femoral artery into the main blood vessel called the aorta, the aorta can have plaque or calcium buildup on it. And as we're coming through with our plastic catheters, uh, we may knock some of that uh, debris off and that could go to the brain. Uh, then when we're coming down and crossing the aortic valve, the actual debris from the patient's old aortic valve, the calcium buildup there, that can also what we call embolize or throw off, shower and go to the brain. And then other things like particulate matter from the actual catheters that we use, the valve platforms that we use, the simple act of doing the procedure with all of that foreign equipment, all of that is potential nidus for a stroke. It's something that we really try to be very cognizant of. And then finally, when patients are getting this procedure done, we do thin their blood, and that blood thinner hopefully protects against stroke, the formation of blood clots on the actual foreign equipment that we're using. So there are a variety of different issues that could lead to someone having a stroke. Are there any ways to reduce stroke risk during TAVR? I think one of the major things that has come across um, you know, my field in the last few years are, are very smart people that have devised technologies, um, and a very particular technology that's been approved by the FDA um, called the Sentinel device, uh, made by Claret Medical. Um, this device is, is really uh, unique in the ability to catch this debris. So when we try to prevent stroke, um, you know, we try to basically shield off the vessels that are supplying the brain, predominantly in the neck area, from receiving any kind of that, uh, any, uh, of that debris that I had talked about earlier. And so this particular device um, has really led to, uh, I would say, a very uh, large revolution in our field um, that patients can really uh, get this procedure done at minimal morbidity and uh, survive the procedure without having a stroke to a large extent. How does the Sentinel Cerebral Protection System work? So the Sentinel Cerebral Protection System is inserted in by the radial artery, which is the artery in the wrist, and that's just a very small needle puncture. There's a small IV that goes in there. And then the actual cerebral protection system is two baskets that are deployed with a uh, deflection catheter. So the catheter goes up and we do this under x-ray guidance very safely. We're able to park one of the baskets in one of the arteries leading up the right side of the neck. And then we're able to flex the tip of the catheter and actually guide it up an artery that goes up the left side of the neck. And those two arteries represent 90% of the brain's circulation. 
And so we're able to capture the debris that's caught during a TAVR procedure and we're able to safely remove it. And the visual um, recognition is there because at the end of the procedure, we're able to filter it out uh, in a sieve and see what we've caught. How might using cerebral and bowel protection affect the procedure risk? I think that it imposes very minimal risk. In fact, uh, most of the analyses that have been done, it's a very safe procedure. Um, you know, there was, uh, in, in the large Sentinel uh, trial that was done, the investigational device exem exemption trial, there was only one vascular complication and it was very readily managed um, in the forearm. Uh, but other than that, it's been a very safe device um, and with very reliable deployment. How might using cerebral embolic protection affect my procedure length? You know, in most hands, uh, with most experienced operators, you know, we try to do the Sentinel Cerebral Protection System in every single um, TAVR patient that's a candidate. Um, it, it really adds only minutes to the procedure, if that. Uh, we're able to get this device up safely and efficiently and be able to, uh, to get a really uh, a, a nice implant that does not affect the procedure length. Is the Sentinel Cerebral Protection Device FDA approved? Yes, it is the only FDA approved cerebral embolic protection device for the setting of transcapillary aortic valve replacement nerve tapper. How do most patients and caregivers react when you explain the benefit of cerebral embolic protection? I think uh, you know, they, they're excited about the ability that we now have to protect them against what I would call the most feared complication of a transcapillary aortic valve replacement and you know when you're when you're elderly uh, and you're being exposed to a valve replacement procedure obviously you have a lot of thoughts that go through your head and your family too and, and you don't want to do things where you know you, you're you're putting yourself at risk or at jeopardy and you want your physicians to take every single precaution that they could take in order to protect you uh, from having a, a dreaded complication like stroke so to preserve quality of life, uh, to be able to get out of the hospital in an efficient fashion, to be able to resume the things that you like to do, and to have this be a uniformly beneficial procedure, uh, this has been nothing but an asset. So talking to patients about it, um, they're very receptive to it, and uh, they're eager to have it be part of their care. Would you recommend using cerebral embolic protection during a TAVR procedure to one of your family members, and why? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, I mean, for several reasons. One is if the operator is proficient at providing this protection, why wouldn't you want that? It's safe. Uh, it's been proven safe. And uh, that's something that I would definitely want just hearing about the mechanism of the technology and its intent. Um, then if you look at the effectiveness data in a variety of clinical trials, many of which have been recently published, um, some single center analyses that have been quite large, robustly studied, uh, analyses, uh, the, the, the effectiveness is definitely there as well. And more and more data is coming out. Every month, every couple of months, there are some really nice papers that end up in very high, uh, highly regarded medical journals. And this is a hot topic at all of our interventional cardiology conferences as well. So it's a highly regarded technology and it's something that I would definitely recommend to any family member undergoing this procedure. Would you share a memorable patient or caregiver story with us regarding cerebral embolic protection during TAVR? Yes, uh, so there are several that come to mind. Uh, I think that uh, the biggest one that I can think of is a lady that had previous, uh, previous stroke and she had a, uh, uh, a surgical um, bioprosthetic valve that was placed about 13 years ago. And that ran its course, the, the tissue decays and that the valve had become narrowed and she was getting shorter breath when, when exerting herself. And so she wanted to get a, a valve procedure done, but um, the, the catch with that was that in the surgical valve that was placed 13 years ago during that hospitalization, she had a stroke. And um, that was very, um, you know, kind of uh, something that evoked a lot of fear, almost post-traumatic stress, and it was something that, you know, became kind of the focal point of our conversations. So when I showed her a video of the Sentinel Cerebral Protection System and how it was deployed, it put her at ease and uh, it made her completely relaxed with regards to the procedure that we were going to do, which is going to be a transcatheter aortic valve replacement within her degenerated surgical valve, which would be done via the groin. And most of those patients leave home the next day, but these surgical valves, when they degenerate, they develop a lot of debris. And so a lot of that can shower all over the body. And I, I find that Sentinel is especially important in those patients, just given what we've caught debris-wise with those particular patients. 
And so we ended up putting up the, the filters. We had uh, really no additional time spent in the procedure. The procedure went very well. The valve deployed nicely. She got an optimal result. At the end of the procedure, we took the Sentinel device out and we, uh, we basically put it through the sieve and we collected a very large basket of debris. And I showed that to her and she just, you know, basically welled up with tears, very thankful for it being used. And um, that, was, that was a very um, touching uh, moment for me. So it was something that, you know, we were privileged enough to offer her and I'm really glad that it put her at ease and had her go forward with the procedure that really would impact her quality of life uh, beneficially. What is recovery like following the TAPR procedure? You know, it, it's become shorter and shorter. Uh, we're able to get people out of the hospital quite efficiently and, uh, and expediently. And a lot of that has to do with avoidance of the complications that I mentioned earlier. So again, focusing on stroke, it's something that we definitely try to avoid because that not only is going to impact the patient's quality of life, but it's gonna impact their hospital stay as well. Um, and so we are able to get patients out of the hospital in the large majority within a day or two, but that means that we did not incur any of those major complications. Do you think TAVR procedures are going to become safer over time and why? Yes, absolutely they will become safer over time. With technologies like these, uh, we're gonna be able to really guarantee patients, uh, almost guarantee patients, uh, a safe outcome at the end of a complex procedure even. Most TAVRs now are uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, we're able to analyze the anatomy with CAT scans up front, understand the clinical predicament that we're stepping into, and be able to navigate the procedure very effectively. I always tell my patients that I believe that 90% of their procedure is done before they even hit the table. And now that we have this type of protective device like a sentinel cerebral log protection device, um, we're able to really put that up and uh, ensure our patients the best possible neurologic outcome as well. So I do envision things getting safer over time. Thank you, Dr. Gata. Is there anything else you'd like to add? And we're happy to take any questions. I'm happy to take any questions. I'm obviously very passionate about this field and I'm very passionate about helping my patients out to the, uh, the largest degree that I could potentially help them. And with the technologies that, um, that UPMC at Pinnacle has been afforded largely because of our administrative support, which has just been really uh, fantastic. Never really witnessed healthcare providers and administration working in such close um, hand in hand type of relationship that we're able to provide these types of technologies to the community. And I'm just really pleased to be able to serve uh, my part in being able to do that.